Chapter Two of the Dog Crusoe and His Master. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Dog Crusoe and His Master by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter Two A Shooting Match and Its Consequences. New Friends Introduced to the Reader. Crusoe and his mother change masters. Shortly after the incident narrated in the last chapter, the squatters of the Mustang Valley lost their leader. Major Hope suddenly announced his intention of quitting the settlement and returning to the civilized world. Private matters, he said, required his presence there. Matters which he did not choose to speak of, which would prevent his returning again to reside among them go he must and being a man of determination go he did but before going he distributed all his goods and chattels among the settlers he even gave away his rifle and fan and crusoe these last however he resolved should go together and as they were well worth having he announced he would give them to the best shot in the valley he stipulated that the winner should escort him to the nearest settlement eastward after which he might return with the rifle on his shoulder accordingly a long level piece of ground on the river's bank with a perpendicular cliff at the end of it was selected as the shooting ground and on the appointed day at the appointed hour the competitors began to assemble well lad first as usual exclaimed joe blunt as he reached the ground and found dick varley there before him i've been here more than an hour looking for a new kind of flower that jack morgan told me he'd seen and i found it too look here did you ever see one like this before blunt leaned his rifle against a tree and carefully examined the flower why yes i seen a many of them up about the rocky mountains but never one here away it seems to have gone lost itself the last i seed if i remembered rightly was near the headwaters of the yellowstone river it was just where i shot a grizzly bar was that the bar that gave you the wipe on the cheek asked varley forgetting the flower in his interest about the bear it was i put six balls in that bodice carcass and stuck my knife into its hot ten times before it gave out and nearly ripped the shirt off my back before i was done with it i would give my rifle to get a chance at a grizzly exclaimed varley with a sudden burst of enthusiasm whoever got it wouldn't have much to brag of remarked a burly young backwoodsman as he joined them his remark was true for poor dick's weapon was but a sorry affair it missed fire and it hung fire and even when it did fire it remained a matter of doubt in its owner's mind whether the slight deviations from the direct line made by his bullets were the result of his or its bad shooting further comment upon it was checked by the arrival of a dozen or more hunters on the scene of action they were a sturdy set of bronzed bold fearless men and one felt on looking at them that they would prove more than a match for several hundreds of indians in open fight a few minutes after the major himself came on the ground with the prize rifle on his shoulder and fan and crusoe at his heels the latter tumbling scrambling and yelping after its mother fat and clumsy and happy as possible having evidently quite forgotten that it had been nearly roasted alive only a few weeks before immediately all eyes were on the rifle and its merits were discussed with animation and well did it deserve discussion for such a piece had never before been seen on the western frontier it was shorter in the barrel and larger in the bore than the weapons chiefly in vogue at that time and besides being of beautiful workmanship it was silver mounted but the grand peculiarity about it and that which afterwards rendered it the mystery of mysteries to the savages was that it had two sets of locks one percussion the other flint so that when the caps failed by taking off the one set of locks and affixing the others it was converted into a flint rifle the major however took care never to run short of caps so that the flint locks were merely held as a reserve in case of need now lads cried major hope stepping up to the point whence they were to shoot remember the terms 
He who first drives the nail obtains the rifle, fan, and her pup, and accompanies me to the nearest settlements. Each man shoots with his own gun and draws lots for the chance. Agreed, cried the man. Well, then, wipe your guns and draw the lots. Henry will fix the nail. Here it is. The individual who stepped, or rather plunged forward to receive the nail, was a rare and remarkable specimen of mankind. Like his comrades, he was half a farmer and half a hunter. Like them, too, he was clad in deerskin and was tall and strong. Nay, more, he was gigantic. But unlike them, he was clumsy, awkward, loose-jointed, and a bad shot. Nevertheless, Henry was an immense favorite in the settlement, for his good humor knew no bounds. No one ever saw him frown. Even when fighting with the savages, as he was sometimes compelled to do in self-defense, he went at them with a sort of jovial rage that was almost laughable. Inconsiderate recklessness was one of his chief characteristics, so that his comrades were rather afraid of him on the war trail or in the hunt, where caution and frequently soundless motion were essential to success or safety. But when Henry had a comrade at his side to check him, he was safe enough, being humble-minded and obedient. Men used to say he must have been born under a lucky star, for, notwithstanding his natural inaptitude for all sorts of backwoods life, he managed to scramble through everything with safety, often with success, and sometimes with credit. To see Henry stalk a deer was worth a long day's journey. Joe Blunt used to say he was all gents together, from the top of his side to the sole of his moccasin. He threw his immense form into the most inconceivable contortions and slowly wound his way, sometimes on hands and knees, sometimes flat through bush and brake, as if there was not a bone in his body, and without the slightest noise. This sort of work was so much against his plunging nature that he took long to learn it. But when, through hard practice and the loss of many a fine deer, he came at length to break himself into it, he gradually progressed to perfection and ultimately became the best stalker in the valley. This and this alone enabled him to procure game, for, being short-sighted, he could hit nothing beyond fifty yards, except a buffalo or a barn door. Yet that same lithe body, which seemed as though totally unhinged, could no more be bent when the muscles were strung than an iron post. No one wrestled with Henry unless he wished to have his back broken. Few could equal, and none could beat him at running or leaping, except Dick Varley. When Henry ran a race, even Joe Blunt laughed outright, for arms and legs went like independent flails. When he leaped, he hurled himself into space with a degree of violence that seemed to ensure a somersault. Yet he always came down with a crash on his feet. Plunging was Henry's forte. He generally lounged about the settlement, when unoccupied, with his hands behind his back, apparently in a reverie, and when called on to act, he seemed to fancy he must have lost time, and could only make up for it by plunging. This habit got him into many awkward scrapes, but his Herculean power as often got him out of them. He was a French-Canadian and a particularly bad speaker of the English language. We offer no apology for this elaborate introduction of Henry, for he was as good-hearted a fellow as ever lived, and deserves special notice. But, to return, the sort of rifle practice called driving the nail, by which this match was to be decided, was, and we believe still is, common among the hunters of the far west. It consisted in this. An ordinary large-headed nail was driven a short way into a plank or tree, and the hunters, standing at a distance of fifty yards or so, fired at it until they succeeded in driving it home. On the present occasion, the major resolved to test their shooting by marking the distance seventy yards. Some of the older men shook their heads. "'It's too far,' said one. "'You might as well try to snuff the nose of a mosquito.' "'Jim Scraggs is the only man as'll hit that,' said another. The man referred to was a long, lank, lantern-jawed fellow with a cross-grained expression of countenance. 
he used the long heavy kentucky rifle which from the ball being a little larger than a pea was called a pea rifle jim was no favorite and had been named scraggs by his companions on account of his appearance in a few minutes the lots were drawn and the shooting began each hunter wiped out the barrel of his piece with his ramrod as he stepped forward then placing a ball in the palm of his left hand he drew the stopper of his powder horn with his teeth and poured out as much powder as sufficed to cover the bullet this was the regular measure among them little time was lost in firing for these men did not hang on their aim the point of the rifle was slowly raised to the object and the instant the sight covered it the ball sped to its mark in a few minutes the nail was encircled by bullet holes scarcely two of which were more than an inch distant from the mark and one fired by joe blunt entered the tree close beside it ah joe said the major i thought you would have carried off the prize so did not i sir returned blunt with a shake of his head had it a been a half a dollar at a hundred yards i had done better but i never could hit the nail it's too small to see that's cause you got no eyes remarked jim scraggs with a sneer as he stepped forward all tongues were now hushed for the expected champion was about to fire the sharp crack of the rifle was followed by a shout for jim had hit the nail head on the edge and part of the bullet stuck to it that wins if there's no better said the major scarce able to conceal his disappointment who comes next to this question henry answered by stepping up to the line straddling his legs and executing preliminary movements with his rifle that seemed to indicate an intention on his part to throw the weapon bodily at the mark he was received with a shout of mingled laughter and applause after gazing steadily at the mark for a few seconds a broad grin overspread his countenance and looking round at his companions he said ha miss boys i cannot behold the nail at all can you behold the tree shouted a voice when the laugh that followed this announcement had somewhat abated oh we oui, replied henry quite coolly i can see him and a good small bit of the forest beyond fire at it then if you hit the tree you deserve the rifle leastwise you ought to get the pup henry grinned again and fired instantly without taking aim the shot was followed by an exclamation of surprise for the bullet was found close beside the nail it's more be good luck than good shootin remarked jim scraggs possible meant answered henry modestly as he retreated to the rear and wiped out his rifle mace i have killed most of my deer by that same good luck bravo henry said major hope as he passed you deserve to win anyhow who's next dick varley cried several voices where's varley come on youngster take your shot the youth came forward with evident reluctance it's of no manner or use he whispered to joe blunt as he passed i can't depend on my old gun never give in whispered blunt encouragingly poor varley's want of confidence in his rifle was merited for on pulling the trigger the faithless lock missed fire lend him another gun cried several voices gainst the rules laid down by major hope said scraggs well so it is try again varley did try again and so successfully too that the ball hit the nail on the head leaving a portion of the lead sticking to its edge of course this was greeted with a cheer and a loud dispute began as to which was the better shot of the two there are others to shoot yet cried the major make way look out the men fell back and the few hunters who had not yet fired took their shots but without coming nearer the mark it was now agreed that jim scraggs and dick varley being the two best shots should try over again and it was also agreed that dick should have the use of blunt's rifle lots were again drawn for the first shot and it fell to dick who immediately stepped out 
aimed somewhat hastily, and fired. "'Hit again!' shouted those who had run forward to examine the mark. "'Half the bullet cut off by the nail-head!' Some of the more enthusiastic of Dick's friends cheered lustily, but the most of the hunters were grave and silent, for they knew Jim's powers, and felt that he would certainly do his best. Jim now stepped up to the line, and, looking earnestly at the mark, threw forward his rifle. At that moment, our friend Crusoe, tired of tormenting his mother, waddled stupidly and innocently into the midst of the crowd of men and, in doing so, received Henry's heel and the full weight of his elephantine body on its forepaw. The horrible and electric yell that instantly issued from his agonized throat could only be compared, as Joe Blunt expressed it, to the last dying screech of a bustin' steam biler. We cannot say that the effect was startling, for these backwoodsmen had been born and bred in the midst of alarms, and were so used to them that a bustin' steam biler itself, unless it had blown them fairly off their legs, would not have startled them. But the effect, such as it was, was sufficient to disconcert the aim of Jim Scraggs, who fired at the same instant and missed the nail by a hair's breadth. Turning round in towering wrath, Scraggs aimed a kick at the poor pup, which, had it taken effect, would certainly have terminated the innocent existence of that remarkable dog on the spot. But quick as lightning, Henry interposed the butt of his rifle, and Jim Shin met it with a violence that caused him to howl with rage and pain. "'Oh, pardon me, brother,' cried Henry, shrinking back with the drollest expression of mingled pity and glee. Jim's discretion on this occasion was superior to his valor. He turned away with a coarse expression of anger and left the ground. Meanwhile, the major handed the silver rifle to young Varley. It couldn't have fallen into better hands, he said. You'll do it credit, lad. I know that fool well, and let me assure you it will never play you false. Only keep it clean, don't overcharge it, aim true, and it will never miss the mark. While the hunters crowded round Dick to congratulate him and examine the piece, he stood with a mingled feeling of bashfulness and delight at his unexpected good fortune. Recovering himself suddenly, he seized his old rifle, and, dropping quietly to the outskirts of the crowd, while the men were still busy handling and discussing the merits of the prize, went up, unobserved, to a boy of about thirteen years of age, and touched him on the shoulder. "'Here, Martson, you know I often said ye should have the old rifle when I was rich enough to get a new one. Take it now, lad. It's come to ye sooner than either us expected.' "'Dick,' said the boy, grasping his friend's hand warmly, "'you're true as heart of oak. It's good of ye, that's a fact.' "'Not a bit, boy. It costs me nothing to give away an old gun I've no use for.' and's worth a little but it makes me right glad to have the chance to do it marston had longed for a rifle ever since he could walk but his prospects of obtaining one were very poor indeed at that time and it is a question whether he did not at that moment experience as much joy in handling the old piece as his friend felt in shouldering the prize a difficulty now occurred which had not before been thought of this was no less than the absolute refusal of Dick Varley's canine property to follow him. Fan had no idea of changing masters without her consent being asked, or her inclination being consulted. "'You'll have to tie her up for a while, I fear,' said the major. "'No fear,' answered the youth. "'Dog's nature like human nature.' Saying this, he seized Crusoe by the neck, stuffed him comfortably into the bosom of his hunting shirt, and walked rapidly away with the prize rifle on his shoulder. Fan had not bargained for this. She stood irresolute, gazing now to the right, now to the left, as the major retired in one direction, and Dick with Crusoe in another. Suddenly Crusoe, who, although comfortable in body, was ill at ease in spirit, gave utterance to a melancholy howl. The mother's love instantly prevailed. For one moment, she pricked up her ears at the sound, and then, lowering them, trotted quietly after her new master, and followed him to his cottage 
on the margin of the lake. End of chapter 2